In lesson one, we're going to learn about computer hardware. First, we're going to discuss why you should learn this stuff. Why should you learn about computer hardware? You're just going to turn the computer on and it works, right? Why do you have to learn about what's inside it? We'll talk about that first. We'll go over some basic definitions. We'll talk about PC versus Mac. And then we'll talk about the different system components that are inside your computer. Okay, computer hardware. Why learn about this stuff? You turn the computer on and it works, right? Well, sometimes knowing what's under the hood can be very helpful. First off, if you're considering buying a new computer, you're gonna invest hundreds, maybe thousands of dollars in a new system, it's beneficial to know what you're buying. This is particularly helpful if you're shopping at one of those mega computer stores where the salesperson might be more focused on their commission than trying to sell you exactly what you need, right? They're trying to give you the greatest products, the biggest and best, and they don't know what your needs are. So knowing about computer hardware equips you with the information you need to make an informed decision on what to buy. Having your PC serviced. Now, when I drop my car off at the local service center or the dealer, and the technician tells me that such and such is wrong, I've got to take his word for it. I know nothing about cars. But you shouldn't find yourself in the same position with computers. Computers are a whole lot easier to learn than cars, at least for me. So with a little bit of knowledge about what's going on under the hood of your computer, you can make more informed decisions about its service and maintenance. Calling for support. I used to work in the tech support industry. I used to be one of those guys on the phones way, way, way back when I was a kid, right? And I know that sometimes phone technicians can unintentionally make callers feel inadequate, like they don't know what they're talking about, even with basic technical terms. So it's essential to have some understanding of the fundamentals of computer terminology to communicate effectively with support staff, even just to let them know that you kind of know what you're talking about. This can help ensure that you get the assistance you need without feeling overwhelmed or patronized. I know calling for tech support can sometimes be intimidating and some people put it off because they just don't understand the person talking to them on the phone. Talking to coworkers and friends or your kids, right? Whether a coworker in the next office asks you for a thumb drive or a friend mentions a particular piece of software, knowing what they're referring to helps in everyday communication. It helps you to feel digitally literate in today's interconnected world. And finally, and most importantly, computers are fun, right? This stuff's fun to learn. I enjoy this stuff. I love this stuff. So even if I wasn't teaching this stuff, I used to love just learning new things all the time. Computers, science, all that good stuff. So it's something new to learn. Okay, now before we get into the hardware, let's go over some basic computer definitions. First, what is a computer? Well, Webster's defines a computer as a programmable, usually electronic, yeah, they can be mechanical, device that can store, retrieve, and process data. While there are more elaborate and specific definitions for the word computer, Webster's definition just about sums it up. A computer is a machine that knows how to do one thing, manipulate data. All the computer really understands is a series of electrical impulses representing numbers, zero and one, on and off, right? But because it can process those ones and zeros so fast, billions of operations per second, right? Like Carl Sagan used to say, billions and billions. Well, since it can do those things so fast, it can do all kinds of wonderful things. It can play a game or edit a spreadsheet or you can play stupid cat videos, right? All of those things are made up of ones and zeros. Now, computers today come in all shapes and sizes, from tablets and laptops to desktop PCs to big rooms with servers on racks. These are all different types of computers. Hardware versus software. Essentially, if you can touch it, it's hardware. That's the general rule. Now, today we're going to learn a lot about different kinds of computer hardware like motherboards, memory chips, video cards, processors, all those things. That's all computer hardware. They're physical objects you can touch. Now, software, on the other hand, represents computer programs like Microsoft Excel, Word, games like Solitaire, even Microsoft Windows itself. Those are usually applications that run on the computer hardware. Now, CDs, for example, if you remember those, the actual CDs themselves are considered hardware because you can touch them, right? But the software on the CD, 
the program on the CD is considered software. The binary system. Now, a few minutes ago, I mentioned that the computer only knows ones and zeros, right? Now, those ones and zeros make up something called the binary system, which is the language inside the computer. And I like to take a moment to cover this with my beginner students because lots of people don't know what the terms megabyte, gigabyte, terabyte, all these things mean. And it's kind of important to know because if you're going to go to the store and buy some memory or a hard drive, you've, you've got to know what these sizes are. Now, they're real simple. It's just how we measure the size of capacities in computer jargon. All right, so binary numbers are represented inside the computer as a series of ones and zeros like this guy right here, right? That is the letter A, the capital letter A, represented by 01000001, which is 65 in decimal. Do you need to remember this? Absolutely not. I'm just trying to give you a feel for how computers store information internally. Now, each one of those ones and zeros internally is called a bit, right? One bit is either a zero or a one. And you can put eight of them together to create something called a byte. So a byte basically represents one character of plain text, an A, a Z, an exclamation point, those kinds of things. Now, this is where the other terms come in. You take byte and you put a Greek prefix in front of it, right? Kill a byte is roughly a thousand, right? Kilos, a thousand, roughly a thousand bytes. Megabyte is million, right? Million bytes. Giga is billion bytes and Terra is trillion bytes. Okay. And yeah, the computer scientists are nerds. We didn't like to make it an even thousand. It's because we want it to be a perfect power of two since everything's two characters. So, there's a long story as to why it's 1024, but essentially you can think of it as a thousand. Now, what kinds of things can you store in each of these sizes? Well, a kilobyte is about the size of a short paragraph of text, right? About a thousand characters, not a whole lot by today's standards. A megabyte is about the size of a high resolution photo. You take a photo with your camera, right? That's about a megabyte. A gigabyte is about an hour of video, right? And a terabyte's huge, all right? Terabytes are, are, are pretty big. All right, now that we're through those basic definitions, let's talk about computer hardware. Now, in the computer world, there are generally two types of computers that you'll find in most businesses and homes. There are PCs and Macs. PC stands for personal computer, and there are a lot of different terms that define what a PC is. Sometimes you'll hear them called IBM personal computers or IBM PC clones. Or sometimes you'll hear them called Microsoft PCs or Windows PCs. But generally, PCs run operating systems from Microsoft, such as Microsoft Windows. Now, Macs, on the other hand, is another popular type of computer you'll find in a lot of homes and businesses. Macintosh computers, or Macs for short, are made by a company called Apple. Macs are very popular in the education, desktop publishing, and graphics arts industries. And PCs generally run the rest of the business world. Now, I am not a Mac user. I haven't touched a Mac since high school in the 1980s, and I don't plan to anytime soon. I could make another whole video as to why I don't like Macs, but that's, again, a topic for another video. Needless to say, I will be focusing on PCs for the remainder of this course and most of my courses. Speaking of PC versus Mac, you guys remember those commercials with the two guys? From years ago, one would say, I'm a PC, and the other said, I'm a Mac, right? These guys, well, Apple used to try to paint PCs as boring and just for business. And back in those days, Macs were a lot better at graphics. They were cool. They were stylish. They came in different colors. But we've come a long way since then, and today, PCs can do pretty much anything a Mac can do. So can you tell I'm not an Apple fan? <laughs> Okay, next up, let's discuss some of the core computer system components. The CPU, or the central processing unit, is basically the brains of the computer, responsible for performing all of the computational tasks, well, most of them. The CPU is typically a small chip mounted on the motherboard, which is a big circuit board inside the computer. Now, you may hear some people refer to the whole computer box or the tower itself as the CPU, but technically, the CPU is a small chip inside of it. The performance of a CPU is measured in clock speed, which represents the number of cycles per second that the CPU can execute. 
In the past, CPUs were rated in megahertz, representing millions of cycles per second. However, today, CPUs have much higher clock speeds, and you'll commonly see them measured in gigahertz, GHZ, representing billions of cycles per second. Remember those Greek numbers from before, right? Mega, giga. You're going to see that a lot in computer terms. Now, the average for most computers sold today, it's 2023, is between two and four gigahertz. The faster the processor, the faster the PC will operate, usually. There are other factors, but the CPU makes up most of it. Today, there are two primary CPU manufacturers that you'll hear of for personal computers. There's Intel and AMD. Both Intel and AMD CPUs feature multiple cores, allowing them to execute multiple tasks simultaneously and enhance overall system performance. You've heard of multitasking. Well, that's what that means. They can take multiple executions and split them up and execute them at the same time. As I mentioned a moment ago, a lot of the times you'll hear people mistakenly refer to the CPU as the whole machine when they actually mean the case or the chassis, it's sometimes called. The CPU is that tiny processor inside the machine that's responsible for executing instructions. As far as cases go, they come in various shapes and sizes. You've got full tower, mid tower, mini tower, desktop, slim desktop, so many different styles and sizes of cases. Now, I personally prefer laptops. It's been a while since I bought a desktop PC or a tower. Uh, for most offices, desktop PCs are the more cost-effective choice. Or if you're a gaming enthusiast and you're looking to customize your PC with high-performance components, a tower is typically the way to go. But for me, I've been a laptop user for the last couple of years myself, so that's my choice. Speaking of the case, if you do happen to open it up and poke around inside, or if you try to upgrade it yourself, you'll see this component. That's the power supply. Now, it's essential to not try to open up this guy. It does have little screws on it. Don't open it. This thing is not designed for servicing by regular people. Only electricians and individual with special knowledge of computer stuff should handle these things, okay? You can replace the whole thing, but don't open up that box. Even if the computer itself is unplugged, this power supply can still give you an electric shock. Trust me, I found this out the hard way years ago. There's a capacitor in there that stores some charge even when the machine is unplugged. So be very, very careful when working with the power supply or any internal components of the computer. Next up is memory. Now there's random access memory, which is the amount of memory the computer has, and that represents how much information the computer can work with at any given time. RAM today is measured in gigabytes. RAM is erased when the power goes off. So if you unplug the computer, whatever's in the memory is gone. If you're writing a letter to mom in Microsoft Word, that letter is generally stored in RAM or the system's memory while you're working on it. So if you turn the computer off without saving your letter, we'll talk about where you save it in just a minute, then you're gonna lose it. Most computers sold today have between eight and 16 gigabytes of RAM. Now you wanna be able to save that letter to mom so you can retrieve it later, right? You can finish it tomorrow, print it out, whatever. That's what your hard drive is for. Now, the hard drive represents the storage space for your computer. Hard drives today are measured in gigabytes or terabytes, and they are permanent storage for all your documents, your Word documents, your Excel spreadsheets, your PowerPoint presentations, whatever videos you've got, all that stuff gets stored on your hard drive. In fact, your operating system itself, Microsoft Windows, is stored on your hard drive. So are the programs, Microsoft Word, Excel, all the programs are loaded onto your hard drive. Generally, hard drives are inside your computer, but you may also see external hard drives as well. There are also two common types of hard drive. The classic kind of hard drive that includes an actual spinning disk inside of it, kind of like a record player, as opposed to the new SSDs or solid state drives that have no moving parts and store everything electronically. These are much faster, but still a lot more expensive than traditional drives. And some PCs come with both. Solid state drives are a lot faster than the traditional hard drives. So you'll see some machines come now with a, a smaller solid state drive for things you use a lot, and then a bigger 
old school hard drive where you can store you know all your old backups and your documents and your your star trek photos and all those things right <laughs> speaking of hard drives if you do decide to open up your computer to explore around or upgrade or whatever do not use any magnetic screwdrivers i learned this the hard way too Inside a traditional hard drive, there's a spinning platter with magnetic material on it. If you bring a magnet too close, you could potentially erase or corrupt some or all of the data on that drive. So keep that in mind. I know it's tempting to use a magnetic screwdriver to hold the, the screw on the tip of the driver to get in a little tight space. But trust me, it's better to avoid it and prevent data loss or damage to your hard drive. I know most of you watching this video aren't going to try to upgrade your computer at home yourself. But in case you do, I'm giving you these tips. Don't touch the power supplies, internals, and don't use magnetic screwdrivers. I got some more tips coming up too. When I used to work in PC tech support, I had so many people that thought that they could upgrade their computer themselves easily and they like did all kinds of nasty things. So that's why I'm just mentioning this stuff. Now, a lot of people have trouble understanding the difference between RAM memory and hard drive space. They may use these terms interchangeably and they're really quite different things. So I like to use the analogy of a desk to illustrate RAM versus hard drive. Remember RAM, which I will call memory, is the amount of information that the computer can work with at any one given moment. That's the stuff in the computer's brain. So if you think of the computer as a desk, then memory would be the top of the desk, the surface of the desk, the things that you can actually see what's going on right now. RAM represents the files you can have open that you can work with at any given moment. You can see them spread out on the desktop in front of you, not like clumped up together like that picture I just got there. <laughs> in fact, I stole some of these old pictures when I first did this class. I did an intro to PCs class way back in like 2002. This was my Windows 101 class. And I, uh, I borrowed some of my older photos. That's why they're so low resolution and grainy. So bear with me. Bear with me. I'm, I'm recycling. <laughs> now... The more files you open, the more stuff you're working with, the more memory that you use. And eventually you're gonna run out of memory and Windows may even tell you, hey, you're out of memory. Well, older versions of Windows usually will. Newer versions do something where they swap memory out to the hard drive, but that's a, don't think of that for this example, okay? That's more advanced. Basically, eventually, simply, you're gonna run out of memory, okay? So we have to close some of those documents down, close some programs that you're running, and what we can do is essentially save those programs from memory to the computer storage or the hard drive. So you got all these different Word documents open, right? You got a spreadsheet open, you got a presentation open. You can save that stuff from memory to the hard drive. So we take those files, we open up a drawer, and we put them on the hard drive. Essentially, we close the documents that frees up the system's memory so it can do other things now. And now if we want to go work with one of those files again, let's say we want to write a letter to mom, we now have more space available in our systems memory so we can open up those files again and bring them from the hard drive back up into the systems memory where we can work on them. And the original file is still saved on the hard drive, so we can always go back to it. All right, so that's the difference between RAM or memory and hard drive space. I used to talk to so many people that were like, I need to upgrade my system's hard drive and they, they really meant memory and, and, or vice versa. You know, I need, more, I need more room in my computer to store stuff. And so they're thinking they got to buy memory. What they really need is a bigger or a second hard drive. So it's, understand, it's, it's important to understand the difference between these two things. All right, continuing on with our parade of hardware components, we've got the motherboard or the system board. Now, most of your other components, the hard drive, the processor, the memory, all those things, they're going to connect to the motherboard or the system board. It's essentially a big circuit board inside the computer that all of the other components plug into. This is basically the backbone of the computer. Now, in addition to those other components we talked about, you may or may not have expansion cards in your computer. Now, back in the day when I started building computers in the early 90s professionally in the late 80s on my own um, you would get your motherboard and then you'd plug all these other components into it and you'd have to have expansion cards for things like a video audio uh, your network card a modem if you wanted to connect to the internet over a telephone line remember those days nowadays for most 
average computers, business computers, a lot of these functions are built directly onto the motherboard. So you don't need an additional video card, network card, audio, all that stuff. It's, it's built right in. So generally, the only people that buy these expansion cards now are people that want high-end systems. For graphics use, gamers do this. They'll buy like a, a really high-end video card so their video games play really fast, that kind of stuff. Musicians might buy updated audio cards. Okay, but nowadays, most of this stuff is integrated directly into the motherboard.